it will be up for you. <clears throat> so let's start off with question number 26, which is all the way down here. And the question is asking which of the following compounds will not be reduced by LiAlH4? So we know it's a reduction reaction we're being asked about. And we also know we're being asked about LiAlH4. So LiAlH4, is that a strong or weak reducing agent? Strong. Strong. Awesome. So strong means that it is able to reduce group one. Uh, it's lagging really bad, but it's okay. Some sound happened. I don't know. I, r I raised my hand. I have a quick question. Oh, okay. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> is, it, is, it is it fair to say that if something is obviously not a strong oxidizing agent, that it is a strong um, reduction agent? So, no. Or is there like a median in between? Wait, so... Okay, you said strong so you, oxidizing. Did you just mean reducing? No, no, no. I'm saying if okay. you see something that is, a, like, let's say it's a strong oxidizing agent, is it fair to say that that would be, um, like, a weak reducing agent? Like, the opposite end of the spectrum? So, like, if you, see, I, or if okay. you see something that is a really weak reducing agent, is it fair to say that's a strong, I mean, weak oxidizing agent, it's a strong reducing agent? Okay, I get where you're coming from, but no, those two categories are going to be completely different from one another. So oxidizing agents and reducing agents, completely different boxes. They do not cross whatsoever. Okay, is with uh, oxidizing agents, I know it's O4 or more. Is there something like that for reducing agents? So for reducing agents, there's only two of them. So the way I like to break it up is LiAlH, whoa. H4 versus NaBH4. So we're comparing A to B. A comes before B in the alphabet, so it must be stronger. Got it. Cool. I like that. Cool. All right. <clears throat> so at this point, we know that it's a strong reagent. It's going to... Um, be able to reduce both groups. And remind me, what kind of molecules make up group one? Hetero atoms is a, is a guess. Mm, let's jump in here for a second. So when we're talking about reductions, Remember, group one and group two is not something that like came from your textbook. It's something I made up because I find it helpful. But we know that group one, as Dustin said, is going to be ketones and alkyhydes, aldehydes, excuse me. And the reason that we call that group one is because they're more reactive. They can react with any reagent, um, super, super reactive. But then we have group two, which is carboxylic acids and esters. And the difference between them is that uh, group two has a leaving group. And that means that it's only going to react with LiAlH4. And we're going to add two hydrogens. So just to repeat, um, it's less reactive. And being less reactive means it only reacts with the stronger reagent. And it has a leaving group, and having a leaving group means you add not just one hydrogen, but you end up adding two. Sort of kind of makes sense, the conceptual part of this. Hello, Eric. Welcome. So basically, um, we went through and we wrote a list of like, what everyone wanted um and some of them were specific questions some of them were concepts so if you have a specific question or a concept i can add it to the list and then we can go through it all right so moving back to the practice problems group one 
is aldehydes. And ketones. Group two is carboxylic acid and esters. Oh yeah, no, it's not an SI session, it's just a tutoring session. Okay, bye. All right, so yeah, group two is carboxylic acid, acids and esters. So we can take away from this that LIALH4 is going to reduce all of these functional groups. The answer, or the question is saying which one of these will not be reduced. So we're looking for the answer that's not one of these guys. So, because I think it's important, we're going to go through all of these functional groups. So what is this functional group? Is that a ketone? It is a ketone. Heck yeah. And, that, and that's because it's an oxygen double bonded to a carbon. And then is it because it's an R group or it's another carbon? Well, okay. So an R group is a carbon, right? So R just stands for any carbon chain. And we want this carbon to be bonded to two carbons. Got it. It is. That's what makes so it. If it were to say, if it were to be two R groups, it would still be the same. Mm -hmm. So be ketone. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. So how about this one? Isn't that an al alcohol? It's slide. Okay, so a couple people got all mushed together. Their voices. Do you want to try that one more time? Okay, two people. Is it alkyd? At Ooh, okay, so three people in the chat said ester, and you said aldehyde, so let's take a look. We have a carbonyl carbon right here. On one side, it's attached to a carbon. On the other side, it's attached to an oxygen and a CH3. So this actually looks like that. And so this bad boy is an ester. Quick, what's the difference between an ester and an ether? What does an ether look like? It doesn't have an oxygen double bonded. Perfect. So it's missing that um, carbonyl. And, <laughs> okay, so I said this the other day. Um, you could think of it as RAR. Or you could say that there's a carbon group on ether side of the oxygen. And then here you could think that the ester has these two sisters. I personally like roar, but whatever works for you. <laughs> roar. All right. So the next one. On the blue. What is this guy? Is it a carboxylic acid? Oh. oh. So <laughs> someone said carboxylic acid. And they are correct. So anytime we see this C O O H, so you could see it as this. We know that that is showing us this functional group. Now, the one that you have been wanting since the beginning, the aldehyde. I don't know why they turned it around like that, but ta-da. So is everyone okay with this naming of the answer choices? Yes, all right, cool. So we actually do have one more answer choice. What is A? It's just an alkene. Just an alkene, cool. So 
is an alkene in either of these lists? No. So our answer would be A, because A is the only one that lithium aluminum hydride cannot reduce. Yeah, also a couple people just joined. Hello and welcome. Um, quick question. Yeah. I thought that um, the ketones in the aldehyde, they're part of group one, right? Yeah. And wouldn't they wouldn't they also count as stuff that um would it, that L I A L H four wouldn't reduce? Okay, so the thing with that is since L I A L H four is a super strong reagent, it can reduce both groups, no problem. Right? Um so group one can be reduced by either reagent because it's super strong. It it can use the weak reagent, no problem. And then if there's a super strong reagent, it's kind of like excessive, like it's being extra. It doesn't need a strong reagent, but it definitely could happen. Whereas group two could not use the weak reagent at all. It will not happen. So it has to use lithium aluminum hydride. So you kind of had it like, you had the idea, but a little bit backwards. So lithium aluminum hydride can work for both, even the strong group, but um, NADH4 cannot work for the weak group. Make sense? Okay, cool. Wait, I'm sorry, what did you say about um, NADH4? So NABH4 is weak and it only works on group one. LIALH4 okay. works for both. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Alrighty, so the next topic on our list. Is number 36. Okay, so this is actually a really, really good question. And then after we finish this question, I know a bunch of new people came, so I'll basically tell you what we're going through today, what order, etc., things like that. So the question is, which of the following Grignard reagents won't work, right? So all you have to think about is Grignard, and fail to occur. When do Grignard reagents fail? Isn't it when there's like a carboxylic acid? Um... Acidic hydrogen. Acidic hydrogen, yes. So it's going to fail when we have an acidic hydrogen. And like you were saying, I believe that was Darlene, um, that's a carboxylic acid, a triple bond, and a hydrogen directly wow, attached to a hetero atom. So those are the three cases where the reaction would fail to occur. So basically, we're looking for an answer choice that has one of these three conditions. So I'm going to zoom in a tad. I will zoom back out, I promise. So here, we have just a straight carbon chain. That one's fine. That checks out. Here we have a carbon chain that is going to be a benzene ring, but that's fine. No acidic protons there, so we get rid of this one. And we get rid of this one because we know they work out just fine. Now, here we see an oxygen. Here we see an oxygen. Without drawing it out, what is... I'm so sorry. Hello? Okay. So A, what is the functional group written for A? B. 
Is that just a methyl group? A what group? A CH3. Is the CH3 just a methyl group? Yes, but it's more specifically on a carbon, um, I mean, excuse me, it's a carbon attached to an oxygen, so it is an ether. So the way you would know that is CHOCH. And does this have any hydrogens that would go under the acidic hydrogen umbrella? No. No, because none of the hydrogens are directly attached to the heteroatom. Perfect. What about C? What's that functional group? We have a carboxylic acid. We do have a carboxylic acid. So we have blah, blah, blah. So does this break the rule? Yes. Mm-hmm. So it does in fact have an acidic hydrogen, so this one will fail to occur as written. Okay. Um, all right, so next up on our list, or actually, okay, any other practice problems from this set before I close it for now? 23? Okay. Don't worry about 23. That's a garbage question. 32. Okay. So isobutyl alcohol, right? <clears throat> OH and isobutyl group looks like this. So one, two, three, four. And we know that the oxygen is going to be one. And then we get two, three. So we end up with two methyl. Uh, pro and all ethanol no butanol no so we're stuck between one or a c and e uh, a has two methyl perfect this has one methyl garbage this has three methyl garbage so a is the correct answer uh, scroll up to what really quick? I can go, just let me know where. <clears throat> 236. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I got you. And I said, don't worry about 23, we just did 32, so let's look at 25. Uh, okay, so this question is annoying, but whatever. So from Orca 1, you guys remember SN2 reactions, right? So in an SN2 reaction, do we want, no, it's okay. Do we want to have more substituted or less substituted electrophiles? Less, exactly. Because in an SN2 reaction, it's going to be one step. So we want less steric hindrance. So which one of these guys has the least sterically hindered OH? Yep. 
Yes, A. That one is the only one with no branching or anything, so that would recur that would occur at the fastest rate. Yay. Any questions about this one? Ooh. Some once in a while it'll show me that you guys do those like little emoji things. That's so cute. I live for it. Okay. Let's go to 38. Nope, we're not doing 38. That's a bad question. Let's do 36. Yeah, 36 was the one you wanted me to scroll back to. Cool. Okay, 29. Yes, perfect. Actually, uh, okay, yeah. So can you briefly explain Steric Hindrance again? So I'm going to explain it even though I moved the screen. So Steric Hindrance comes from big bulky groups interacting, right? So if you want to do an SN2 reaction, Uh, let's see, NADR, right? Because that's what the question was asking. So we want to kick that off, right? And if we had a bunch of big groups here, it would be much harder to get in there and kick off the leaving group. So all that big bulky stuff going on is considered steric hindrance because it's taking up all this space and it's hindering the reaction from happening. Make sense a little bit? Okay, cool. So someone asked for this question. We will go over this question, but I'm also going to find a couple similar questions, wink, wink, to this one that I think are important. So very quickly, if I see a question like this, the first thing I'm going to do is point out my... Um, functional groups. So the yellow one, what functional group is that? Is that an ester? The blue one's an ester, yes. Is that an ether? A ketone. Yeah, the double bond of C's. Exactly. So the ketone is only attached to carbons. Perfect. All right, so then in the final product, the ketone turned into a what? Alcohol. Alcohol. And then the ester turned into a what? Also an alcohol. Also an alcohol, yeah, I just wanted to... See if I could trick anyone. No, both of those are an alcohol. Awesome. So first and foremost, they didn't tell you what kind of reaction happened, but you know, since we went from a ketone and an ester to an alcohol, what kind of reaction did we do? A reduction. Reduction. All right, so we know that in this class, we only talked about two reducing agents, LiAlH4 and NaBH4. So answer choice C is just here to trick us, right? And now we can either pick LiAlH4, NaBH4, or we could pick both. So how do we differentiate which of those reagents it could have been? Well, we have um, an ester, and we know that it's group two, so it would have to be the one that has. Um, it can't go with the NaBH four, so it would have to be the one with the LiAlH four. Perfect answer. Couldn't have said it better myself. So, the ketone is group one, which can use either reagent. Uh, the ester is group two, so it can only use LiAlH four. Therefore, in order to reduce both of those groups we had to, had to, had to use 
this reagent. And Dustin said the same thing in the chat. Okay, so I think that was all the questions you guys had. So let's go back to our list. So we just finished the chapter 11 and 12 problem. Um, wait, you said you were going to um, find some more, you know, problems like that. Wait, wait. Yeah. Yes, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple um, things like for you guys to look at and do because I don't want to just like have an awkward blank screen. And then I'm going to find those problems while you guys are busy with something and then we'll get back into it. Okay. All right. So you guys wanted to talk about complex splitting. And then you wanted to do some chapter 12 mechanisms. And then you wanted some chapter nine practice problems, which I'll just do PP. And specifically you wanted number 32. All right, so all the new people who came in or even the people who are already here, do you have anything to add to this list? I have a question. Um, could we go through all the reagents and like what they do? And if that's not a lot. <laughs> yes, so it's not telling me who is speak. Oh, Darlene. Okay. Yes, Darlene. We can definitely do that. So I'll put that on the list. Um, we're basically going to make a table of reactions. Cool. Anyone else want to add anything to the list? And again, this isn't like, you know, set in stone, whatever. You can add things later as they come up. We can venture other places, what else? Um, okay, so let's go through this list. First thing we're gonna talk about is complex splitting. And I am going to, I know that you can see this happening, which is kind of awkward, but whatever. Don't question my names for people. Airdrop, none found, what are you talking about, bro? It's literally right in front of your face. Okay, what else? I'll work that out with her later. <clears throat> okay, complex splitting. So very quickly before we talk about complex splitting, let's look at how normal splitting works. Normal splitting just it happens when a hydrogen only has neighbors that have the same hybridization as it does. And so we use the n plus one rule and everyone's happy dandy, right? Complex splitting, however, is when we have different hybridizations present, which means we have different J values present. And what the heck is a J value? Well, I know your professor at least Dr. West, I'm not 100% sure about Dr. Roche. So your professor showed you something called a tree diagram. We're not gonna go crazy into that because I know that's confusing and scary, but we know that when we have one signal and that signal has a neighbor, the signal is going to be split into two peaks because of that neighbor. And that's why we have doublet, singlet, triplet, what have you not. So if this guy has one neighbor, we do one plus one, this would be a doublet and that's shown in the peaks here. I didn't make that even, bam, bam, right? This distance right here, the distance between those peaks, that is the J value. <clears throat> So I will give you a, a moment to take a look at this and then we can like do some examples for coupling or complex splitting or we can go through this again or what what have you not. So take a moment. Uh, I had a question. Um, so 
uh, would it be possible, um, like, if someone asked, like, um, to find the splitting pattern from, say, like, an sp3 hydrogen to an sp2 hydrogen, like, the one in this example, like, if it asks for the splitting from, like, one of the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen from the sp3, and then So like you this one for the n plus yeah yeah like would you be able to use like the n one plus one times n two we would have to use that except it only has one neighbor or the sp2 yeah yeah so you would just use n plus one at that point because there's nothing else to multiply oh okay i was um hmm um So it's just a regular n plus one. You don't have to do like a tree diagram or anything like that. Yeah, exactly, because, like, they are different J values, but it only has one neighbor. So it's like, it's, okay, when we're talking about what I said with J values, the J value is here and here, right? So this is sp2 to sp3. This is sp2 to sp2. So this pair is different than this pair. It's not necessarily just that sp2 is different than sp3, so this is complex splitting, right? Because this red one only has one neighbor, so it has to be just n plus one. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Okay, cool, good. All right, and then eight is not the j value, eight is like the multiplicity. So if he were to tell you, like, what's the multiplicity and splitting of this blue hydrogen right here, 8 would be the multiplicity. The J, and that is the number of peaks. So the J value is not the number of peaks, it's the distance between the peaks. So that would be like, if we were looking at a spectrum, that would be this distance right here. Okay. Alrighty. So, any other questions on complex splitting? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. And I'm going to... Open up the chapter nine, practice problem. Okay, don't look at what's written here. Don't look, don't look, don't look. All right, so I want you guys to take like a minute. You guys can talk to one another. You can type in the chat, whatever. And I just want you to think this question through because this is a complex splitting question. So I'll give you two minutes. Yeah, for anyone who's um, like here and wants to go over this question, um, I think I understand that. I just have one quick question. Because it's dibromopentane, right? We know it's going to be a five carbon chain um, with two bromines on the first carbon. Um, that means that on C2, that's, the, that's where we're looking for the hydrogens, correct? So 
So we have both bromines on the first carbon and the second carbon we're connected we're connected to the first carbon and uh the third carbon that's already two bonds so doesn't that mean that we only have two bonds for hydrogen so it's a potential chiral center but we are still only left with the multiplicity of two All right, there was an effort, um, but it was kind of painful to watch. I'll give you guys like 20 more seconds if anyone wants to jump in and answer that question. Love the support, Rose. Thank you. Okay, I think the answer might be D because I drew out the like chain and on the um, carbon with the bromines, there's one hydrogen. So you do the one plus one row and then on carbon three, there's two. So you do two plus one and then you multiply those numbers together and get six. I don't know. That could work, but yeah, that, that, you're not wrong. I didn't think about that. I, I mixed up integration and multiplicity and that was my issue. So I think you're right. And now that some communication has been had, um, let's talk about it. All right, so I was trying to listen to what you guys were kind of saying and look at the chat at the same time. So what do we think the answer is? D. D. Okay, cool. So, first of all, 1 1 dibromo dibromo pentane. Was, was everyone able to draw that out? <clears throat> we'll draw it together just in case. So, pentane 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's 1,1 one, one, dibromo. And I heard someone saying about a chiral center. What was that all about? Um, if you look at carbon, what is it? Carbon 2, is it? Okay. Yeah, carbon 2, it's a potential chiral center. It's a potential chiral center. Cool, cool. Um, we could also say that about carbons three and four, since there's no symmetry. So all of these guys could be potential chiral centers. Cool, but that just means an antiotopic, right? So we're gonna leave those alone right now. Um, and then we knew we were looking at this pair of hydrogens, and you guys said D. There are six neighbors. Are you sure about that? Okay. Six neighbors from the hydrogen that you have highlighted? Mm-hmm. Or five neighbors and the multiplicity would be six. So we're looking at the hydrogens on C2, right? And you guys said it's a potential chiral center, but there's no real chiral centers present, right? So that's not going to be diastereotopic. 
So we would have one neighbor here. We have... And then two over there on three. Yeah, two neighbors here. So why didn't you just do two plus three plus one? Oh, wait, just kidding. That is what you guys did. So why did you do that? Because Question. it said the coupling constants for the neighboring proteins are different. So there it's complex. It. Cool. Okay, that's all I wanted to hear. Coupling constants are sufficiently different. So this is going to be a complex splitting question, right? So instead of n plus 1, n, um, just n plus 1, sorry, we're going to do n1 plus 1 times n2 plus 1, which gave us 2 times 3, which equals 6. So you guys were absolutely right. I just wanted to make sure you were getting there. The correct way uh, can you please show me um like can you elaborate where you got the two and the three please thank yeah, you yeah absolutely so let's make this black so i can color code it okay so n1 and n2 just mean the neighbors on the left and neighbors on the right so i'm gonna do <clears throat> n plus one and we have one blue hydrogen and we multiply that by n plus 1 and on the other side we have two red hydrogens so 1 plus 1 would be 2 2 plus 1 would be 3 and once you multiply them together you would get 6 and so what would the name for this be? <clears throat> is that a doublet of triplets? Yes, it is. Awesome. <sighs> Sorry. <clears throat> Any other questions about splitting? If not, we can go ahead and move on. Um, the next thing on our list was chapter 12 mechanisms. So let's go into the review because <clears throat> I love this review packet. All right, so 11 and 12 are kind of like mishmashed together. So let's just go through all of those reactions, right? So Dr. West said that there won't be any dehydration of alcohol reactions, and he said there will be very, very, very few synthesis of alcohol reactions. So if you just take a look at this table and you basically memorize it, um, you should be good. What did Roche say? I don't know. Um, Dr. West said that they will be having pretty much the same exam besides mass spec. So I'm like assuming that, oh, you poor things. <laughs> That's okay. I understand the frustration. Um, on, on the, yeah, I understand the frustration. All right. So let's cover protecting groups right quick. So protecting groups are super fun because chemists use it for all kinds of different reasons. For the purposes of this class, we're going to use them to protect alcohols. And we can either um, just protect the alcohol and bring it back at the end, or we can take the alcohol and switch up the stereochemistry. So this is really a useful technique. The first protecting group we're going to talk about, let me move that a little bit, is PBR3. So PBR3 is going to turn an OH group 
into a bromine group. And let me actually just move this completely. <clears throat> Other reagents that do the same thing, but <clears throat> same thing, but are not as popular is PCl5, PCl3, SOCl2, so on and so forth. So these guys will do the same thing, but the most popular one is PBr3. So what does that do? Well, let's say we have an alcohol on a wedged position and we react it with PBr3. This is going to happen in an SN2-like mechanism. So SN2 means we invert the stereochemistry or we flip the stereochemistry. So it goes from wedged OH to a dashed BR. So we are flipping stereochem. Um, at this point, this is all PBR3 does, right? This is PBR3's job ends here. If we wanted to bring this back into an alcohol, let me do like a little half line. So let's say we wanted to take the BR that we just formed and we wanted to turn it back into an alcohol. We can definitely use a reaction from Orgo1, vomit, I know, but we could redo. There we go. We could use something like NaOH, and that would also be. Bye. You're very welcome. Have fun in class. That would also be an SN2 reaction. So this will also flip stereochemistry, and we're gonna replace the Br with an alcohol. So we are going to get. ROH back. And notice we had to flip stereochem again. Ta da. So overall, we got a, uh, we got retention of stereochemistry if we use PBR3 and then we turn it back into an alcohol. So a little hint that I will give you guys for protecting groups in Orgo 2. Um, whatever protecting group you use, whatever is going on, the step where you um, go back into an alcohol or whatever else, honestly, is always going to be Na something, NaOH, or NaI or NaBr, right? And it's always going to be SN2. So it's going to flip stereochem. And in this case, it would bring back OH. Um, coming off of that, you could replace this group with anything and whatever you replace that group with that's what will be added instead of your leaving group so let me zoom out I know that was kind of a weird wordy sentence so let me know if you have any questions at this point okay okay so the second one is mesylate and tosylate. And actually, I think it's going to be a better use of time if I just go to the 11 and 12 handout real quick, just so I don't have to redraw everything a million times. I believe that's, where's chapter 11? There we are. Okay. So protecting groups, we already talked about PBR3. Um, but I do want to ask you guys a question. 
Which alcohol do you think would react most rapidly with PBR3? Just based off what we talked about. Okay, someone's at A. Why? Why do we say A, Darla? Or Darlena? Dar Darlene, I'm so Right. It's fine. That's not even my name. But oh. that's a different story. Anyways. <laughs> um, I say A because you said it's like a SN2 reaction, so doesn't it need the less theoretically hindered thing? Mm -hmm. Or I'll, I'll say less steric hindrance. And so we want the one with the least branching. This obviously has the most. And then this one is secondary. These ones are both primary. So why'd you pick A over B? The methyl is farther away. Perfect. So if you have branching on both the options, you want the one that's the furthest away. So A would be correct. Awesome. Any questions on how we just came to that answer? Yes, no, maybe so. All right, and un until I get a question, I'm gonna move on. So, um, mesylate and tosylate groups are these guys. So, this, is a tosylate this is a mesylate and this chlorine is going to react with the oxygen to give you that so when he asks you what is a tosylate group you want this Similarly, this chlorine is going to fall off. The sulfur attaches to that oxygen. It, I meant to do that this way. The oxygen. And we end up with this group. So if he asks you for a mesylate, that's what he's talking about. So what the heck do mesylates and tosylates do? What's the purpose of them? Well, they are also protecting groups. But now, since... They are purely just adding to that oxygen. They are both going to keep the stereochemistry. So we would get this weird intermediate thing and we would keep the stereochemistry from the original alcohol. Um, like I said, for PBR3, a lot of the times you want to go back to an alcohol or go back to something else. In this example, I spiced it up and I gave you NAI. So we have been doing practice problems with NAI, though, so I'm going to replace that with NABR. Not that it really makes a difference, but okay. So he told you that we have this reagent, and he was nice enough to say tosylate at the bottom. So we know that the intermediate is going to look like this. We don't change that other chiral center. And we get O attached to S. I regret drawing this out now. Ta-da. So that's our intermediate. That's our tosylate, right? At this point, we want to get our alcohol back, so we're going to react with NABR. What kind of mechanism is that? In the simplest terms. Come on, everybody, I know you know this. SN2, yes. So, sorry if I'm making so much noise right now. Uh, this is an SN2 reaction. So, the BR comes in. 
and kicks off the leaving group. And we know that we have to do what to the stereochemistry? Change it. We have to flip it. Cool. So our final answer is going to be this. This does not change. Only the stereocenter with alcohol changes. But we go from wedged to dashed. And what do we have here? What's the group that we added? A BR, absolutely. So this would be your answer. And just to summarize all of that, um, I mean this little protecting group summary. So if we have PBR3, first step is SN2. So what happens to the stereochemistry? Keep or flip? Flip. All right, and then if we want to go back to the alcohol, that's also SN2. So what do we do? Keep or flip? Flip. Exactly. So overall, what happens to the stereochemistry? Nothing. So overall, we retain stereochem. And that's when we bring back the alcohol. So for the mesylate tosylate in the first step, it's not SN2. So what happens to the um, stereochemistry? Do we keep it or flip it? Keep. Awesome. In the second step, this is absolutely SN2. So what happens? Keep or flip? Flip, yes. So overall, what happens to the stereochemistry of the alcohol? It gets flipped. So a lot of times students actually have a hard time grasping this concept, how does this feel? How are we doing? Good, yay! Okay. Um, yeah, so you can take a look at this uh, protecting group page. The mesylate test tosylate thing is weird. Yeah, but it's glad, I'm glad that you get it. Okay, so I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Chalet? I know we were struggling with this stuff yesterday. Mm, yeah. Does it feel any better than it was yesterday? Yes. I feel like my brain, does sleeping help? Good, good. <laughs> yeah, everyone yesterday looked like they were so close to a nervous breakdown, which I understand, but I hope I'm... I hope like you got some sleep, ate breakfast, and all of that helped. So, yeah. And then Simon, could you like privately message me your last name just so when I do attendance, I know which Simon it was. Got sleep, it's still stressing though. I uh, felt that. <laughs> On the bright side, it'll be over soon and you won't have to stress for a couple more weeks. <laughs> and now you know what tutoring is and what SI is, so you're so welcome. Love to help. I live for it. Okay, so what other reactions do we have? Let's go back here. Can we look at the um, Williamson ether 
reaction, I think it's called. You are not going to have that on your test. Even for Roche? As far as I know, yeah, there will be no ethers and epoxides. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, Katrina showed me the, like, roadmap, the reaction roadmap he made for you guys, and I was like, what? <laughs> what is happening? Which I'm sure that's how you guys feel a lot of the time, so I am so sorry. Um, all right. So chapter 11 and 12 reactions. The next thing we have up on the list is oxidation and reduction. So oxidation is just when we make more bonds to oxygen. Reduction is when we lose bonds to oxygen. Or we reduce the number of bonds to oxygen. That's not like the best, um, what do you call it, explanation. Like there are less specific explanations but for the purposes of this class this is absolutely good enough so when we're talking about oxidizing reagents we're going to say that a strong oxidizing agent is anyone on the list that has uh, o4 or more and then dmso and pcc are going to count as weak oxidizing reagents for reduction, luckily we only have two to remember. We have LiAlH4 and NaBH4. A comes before B in the alphabet, so that one is going to be stronger. Any questions? Okay. So we move on to oxidation. So oxidation, like we said, we're making more bonds to oxygen. And I drew out in the corner just what a primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohol look like. So first we started with a primary alcohol. And if we use a strong reagent, you are going to get a carboxylic acid. If you use a weak reagent, you're going to get an aldehyde. And if you have a secondary carbon, uh, sorry, if you have a secondary alcohol, you are going to get a ketone regardless of what reagents you use. I know that was kind of fast, but oxidation, they said, wouldn't be a big thing on the test. So I want to focus more time on reduction, but does anyone have any questions about this? <clears throat> or any strong feelings? Okay, Arthi, I remember your name. I know exactly who you are. <laughs> it took too long. I apologize, but I remember now. Okay, sorry. I just had to... Uh, had to get that out of my system. <laughs> okay, so as far as reduction reactions go, first thing you have to know, reducing species is H minus. That's the thing that's actually doing the reducing. Now we flipped, I mean, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> we separated all of our carbonyls into two groups. So we have our um, ketones and aldehydes, which are group one. And then we have our, um, what do you call it? Esters and carboxylic acids that are group two. The main difference between group one and group two is that group one is super duper reactive and group two has a leaving group. So when we reduce anything in group one, we are only gonna add one hydrogen so if we reduce an aldehyde, we get a ketone. Uh, I'm so sorry. If we reduce an aldehyde, we get a primary alcohol. If we reduce a ketone, we get a secondary alcohol. I'm going to say that again because I messed up. If we reduce an aldehyde, we get a primary alcohol. If we reduce 
a ketone, we get a secondary alcohol. And that's really all you need to know. You don't have to know every step of the mechanism, although it is useful. So as far as group two goes, again, remember, group two has to, has to, has to be LiAlH4, um, whereas group one could use either reagent. And in group two, since we have a leaving group, <clears throat> we are going to add two hydrogens. So both of our group two starting materials, which are carboxylic acids and esters, are both going to reduce twice and give us a primary alcohol. <clears throat> so again, carboxylic acid and ester, when reacted with lithium aluminum hydride, are both going to reduce twice and give us a primary alcohol. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Before we go into the green yard, I'm just going to check that list one more time. We did this one. We're doing this one. All right, cool. We're not making awful time. That's what matters. So the Grignard reaction, a lot of students were having a lot of trouble with the Grignard. Um, so let's talk about it. All right. It's already drawn out so you don't have to draw. You can just kind of focus on absorbing and listening to what I'm saying. So we are going to start with an alkyl halide when we are making the Grignard reagent. So when we're making the Grignard reagent, we react alkyl halide with magnesium. Magnesium is a hoe. It's going to come in and be a home wrecker and it's going to take bromine away from the carbon. And carbon is really, really sad about it because he just is negative all the time. So sad. Right? And so that negative charge, aka the Grignard reagent, is able to work as either a very strong nucleophile or a very strong base. It can do both. But it can't do both at the same time because a nucleophile uses its electrons to attack a molecule and attach to it, right? Whereas a base just wants to steal a hydrogen. It doesn't care. Ow, that was a strong hiccup. It doesn't care what's going on. All it wants is to steal a hydrogen. So, ow. when we're doing the Grignard reaction, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I have the hiccups. I might die. Ow. I forgot to bring water with me. Mm. Hold on, I'm just going to willpower make it go away. Okay, I think that's good enough. <laughs> okay, screaming helps, I've heard. Um, I totally would love to scream, but I'm in the middle of a very busy building, so I don't think that's a nice thing to do. Anyway, we're just gonna, we're gonna ignore it. We're gonna pretend ow, that that's not happening. Um, where were we? What? Ow. So, the Grignard reaction, we know that the Grignard reagent Oh my god, it wants to act like a nucleophile and it wants to attack this this carbonyl carbon. And once it attacks this carbonyl carbon, it's going to be added here. Right? So that's gonna be a new group on that carbon. <laughs> Breathe. No. I will not. Okay. So if we have a leaving group, 
we know that the um, drain yard reagent can come in. Okay. It can come in again and attack twice, and we're going to add this, this twice. Okay, well, I'm having technical difficulties with myself. So we are going to take a, a two-minute break. I will be right back. Hopefully, I will not have the hiccups anymore. Give me a second. Okay, so I am back. I'm not hiccupless. It's just something we're going to have to live with. Nothing was working. It's it's fine. Okay. Did did we finish with the Grignards? I don't remember if I was able to get through that or not. Or do you guys want me to re repeat any part of that? Mm -hmm. I believe you were explaining the the blue where that, that has the blue marker. Okay. Yeah. So this part. So the yes, I do remember now. So, so the Grignard reagent wants to be a nucleophile, right? So when it is is reacting with a carbonyl, you're gonna have it attack here, and it's basically. <laughs> excuse me, basically going to do an addition reaction <clears throat> so that, excuse me, it's stuck on here by Dustin. Um, and then we form an al alcohol. If we have a leaving group, you are going to attach the nucleophile and then you're going to be able to kick off the leaving group and you're going to be able to have two mo moles of the um, reagent, reagent attached to that carbonyl carbon. Yeah, the hiccups are, are intensifying. Oh my goodness. I don't know what's wrong with the body. The, uh, the stress is... Yeah. Wait, sorry. So, as long as a carbonyl compound, as long as a carbonyl carbon is present, you could do a green yard reaction? Exactly, yes. Okay. It, and then to Evelyn, you, you had kind of a similar question. Um, how many leaving groups could you have? Theoretically, you could have up to two, excuse me. But in this class, you're just going to have one, usually. Good, good times. All right, so when does this not, not happen? Um, so this reaction is not going to work. If we have some kind of um, acidic 
proton present. So if you have an acidic hydrogen, <laughs> hydrogen, which would be any of these things, So if you have any of these things, you will get no reaction because the Grignard reagent will choose to act like a base and steal this hydrogen instead of, excuse me, acting like a nucleophile. I think this is it, guys. I think I'm dying. Sound like a frog. Okay. If I, if I die on camera, that would be so awkward. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Uh, all right. Yeah. So if there's an acidic H, um, it will act like a base first, not a, nucle not a nucleophile, and that will cause no reaction. And it's the, <laughs> Excuse me. It's the fact that it, um, <gasps> okay, so what you said was if there's an acidic H and a carboxylic acid, so the reason this is an acidic H is because it's on a carboxylic acid. So that's why it wouldn't it wouldn't work because it would steal this and then it wouldn't be able to attack here. And what about, excuse me, what about aldehydes? That doesn't matter. Um, they're not considered acidic. Only, for the purposes of this reaction, only these guys are considered acidic. Life is pain. And if we go down here, um, if we were to have an acidic, excuse me, acidic hydrogen in the making a Grignard step, this is what would happen. It would still be no re, excuse me, no reaction because that C minus minus would want to act like a base and not a nucleophile. <laughs> What? Sorry. What do you mean by like the making step? Okay, so what I mean by that is when it comes to the Grignard reaction, we can fir first make the Grignard reagent. You can't see where I'm pointing. You can first make the Grignard reagent. So this is just an alkyl halide, just magnesium, but together they make the Gr Grignard reagent. So that's the making a Grignard step. And then here we have the, the actual Grignard reaction. So you're saying if like the alkyl halide has like a triple bond already on it? Exactly. So if, like it, that? if it had a triple bond or an alcohol or something, then it wouldn't work. Gotcha. Cool. So good. So good. All right. So those are all the reactions. So let's go over here. Yay. And we kind of did this one too, so I'll do like a half mark. So chapter nine practice problems, number number thirty-two. In case you were wondering, I am not, not having a good time. Okay, so. Any ones that are like this where you have to draw an answer, answer don't worry about them. Only focus on the ones that are, excuse me, that are like this. Where you have to figure out the 
the answer of the four choices. Do you want to do one like this or a couple like this? Because I know I've done it in my SI sessions, but I don't think Roche kids have seen it. Okay, cool. I'm not going to die of the hiccups. It's fine. Alrighty, so the first thing I'm going to do when I look at a spectrum is look at the number of signals. So here we have four signals. So we're going to look for the answer that has four signals. Before we do that, I also noticed this is the alkyl region and this is the heteroatom region. And also, wow, we have a 6H integration. All right, cool. So first things first, let's look for which... <laughs> which answer choice has four signals. The first thing we're always going to look for, excuse me, is symmetry. So we have symmetry right here. <coughs> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So we have one hydrogen signal, two, three, four. Okay, that works. The next one, we have symmetry here. So we have one, two, okay, two, three, four, five. That is too many signals. We're going to cross that one out since we only have four. When we go here, <laughs> sorry. We have no symmetry, so we're just going to go left to right. One, two, three, four. Okay, so that's possible. Here, we're going to do symmetry, excuse me, right down the middle. One here, two here, three here. So we don't have enough signals. Because remember, we had four signal signals. And then here, we have symmetry down here. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my God. We have one, two, three, three, four signals. All right. So we were able to get rid of two answer choices just by looking at the number of signals. Now... We saw that there is a signal with an integration of six in the in the heteroatom region. So let's see if we can find which one has a six H integration in, in the heteroatom region. So let's go to A. All right, we have we have one, two, three, four, five. Six. Okay, that looks pretty, pretty promising. Um, are the are are those in the heteroatom region? Yes, they are because they are attached. Sorry, they are attached to a carbon that is attached to to an oxygen. All right, so this one seems, seems to check out. Let's check the other guys. There's only two, excuse me. There's only two hydrogens in the heteroatom region. This one has one, two, three, four, but we already marked that one out, so, so we don't care, ow. Here we have an integration of six, but is this in the heteroatom region? No, so the right answer ha has to be A. Ta-da. <laughs> um, just to be sure, we eliminated the last answer because 
uh, the CH3s were not part of the other atom region? <laughs> exactly. So the integration of six was supposed to be in the hetero atom region, but here they were not. <laughs> For that last answer choice, they were in the alkyl region. Oh my gosh. Okay, so any other questions here? Can we look at number 10, please? I am confused. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, let's do number 10. Okay, so first things first, where can we do the following one? Yes. I was confused on finding if there was a, if there was a, if there was symmetry. It looked like there's symmetry, but I'm not sure how to draw it. Yeah, okay, so <clears throat> we can see that there is a line of symmetry here because, because these two sli sides line up, but within the ring, there's another line of symmetry here. So all four of these carbons are exactly the same, which means all four of those hydrogens are exactly the same. And then we have this one, which is symmetrical to this one. This one, which is symmetrical to this one. And now it's too similar. That one, which is symmetrical to that one. So all together, we would have one, two, three, four, excuse me, four, five, one, two, three, four signals. The hiccups are taking away my brain cell cells one at a time. <clears throat> so Evelyn, which one did you want to want to go over the 11 or go back to the last one that we did and do the following one? 45. Uh, go back to the last one. Okay. Ow. Who got to decide that hiccups get to hurt? It's not fair. Okay. All right. So, in this graph, um, or in this spectrum, you see, see something that you're probably not going to see on your exam. Um, all of these signals are clumped up into one big signal and <clears throat> that is in the <clears throat> heteroatom region <clears throat> so in the heteroatom region we're, I mean I lied to you I lied to you so hard it's in the aromatic region Thank you, Stephanie, for calling that out. So, um, in the aromatic region, you're just expected to know benzene. We haven't talked about any other aromatic compounds. And so, we know that, like we just saw in, in benzene, we can have a different number of signals based on where symmetry is. But this is telling us that, that all five hydrogens on the benzene ring are smushed together. <laughs> Excuse me, because we have a really bad NMR machine, it doesn't have high enough resolution to see see each of these separate peaks, so they all look as one big blob. We're going to use that, that to our advantage, so we're going to go through and see which of these benzene rings has five hydrogens on it. One, two, three, four, five. This could be it. One two, three, four. Oops, not, en uh, not enough. Yes, this is being recorded, unfortunately. This next one, it doesn't actually have a benzene ring. This is a trick. So this is not aromatic. That's just a cyclohexane. So that one's out. 
this next one. One, two, three, four, four, five hydrogens. This could be it. One, two, three, four, five hydrogens. This could be it. Cool. So we were able to cross out two answer choices and we're stuck with three left. And the next big thing we see is you have a peak all the way at 12. <laughs> Excuse me. What functional group is at 12? Is that carboxylic acid? Yes. So 12 equals carboxylic. What is around 9? <laughs> Excuse me. That's going to be an aldehyde. An aldehyde? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, exactly. So if it was around the 9 region, that would have been an aldehyde. Excuse me. Aldehyde over here in the 12 is going to be a carboxylic acid. And that's important because this is a carboxylic acid. This is a carboxylic acid. This guy is an aldehyde in disguise. In disguise. So, um, I lost where I was at because that hiccup was so painful. Yes, okay, so this last answer has an aldehyde, not, not a ketone, so we get rid of those, right? And I don't know why I didn't highlight this one. Okay, so now we're stuck between answer choice A, and, and I think this is... D. So how are we going to choose between these two? Could we, could we look at the integrations to choose the answer? Ab absolutely. So we have an integration of 2 and an integration of 2 over here. 2H. 2H. Perfect. And then over here, we have 1H, 3, 3H. So only answer choice A matches the integrations. So that's why A is correct. And then um, someone asked, where is the ether? What exactly do you mean? Do you mean like, where would an ether be in the regions or... Okay, so, so a hydrogen attached to an ether would be in the heteroatom region because you would have the hyd hydrogen connected to a carbon that's connected to a heteroatom. So that would be three to five. Mm. Someone asked me to go over some NMR stuff, but we only have a couple minutes left, and I really am... Not feeling it. Um, so watch the NMR, NMR videos. If you're able to come to the next session, that's from three to five, and we can cover it. And then if you have questions, questions, email me, and I will try my best to get back to you. Also, please give me your last name so I can do attendance. Uh, hey, sorry. One last question. Thanks. Um. Mm -hmm. Wes said during the review session that we won't need to know about phenols or epoxides since we weren't really able to get into them, right? Yeah. Okay, so we won't need to, like, know any no. questions about it. Because I was going to ask about number two on the chapter 12 handout. It was asking about, uh, like, a phenol group, but yeah, I, since we don't need to know about it, it's fine. Okay. Don't worry about it. Thank you. It. You're very welcome. Okay, everybody. We're going to, oh my God, we're going to call it a day. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything of that sort, please let me, let me know. Um, but yeah, to anyone who's taking their test today, good luck. You're going to do amazing. Don't freak out. It's on Canvas. You got this. I believe in you. And if, if you make it out alive, I have a brand new pack of stickers 
that have lots of cute little animals just for you. Everyone who gets through the exam gets a sticker. Yay. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I will try. <laughs> Darling, you kid, kidder. <laughs> okay, I am going to end the recording now. So, adios, everybody.